Industrial engineering at Purdue emerged gradually. The early manifestations of IE at Purdue were found in the School of Practical Mechanics, later migrating to mechanical engineering in the Department of General Engineering as the attitudes and labels for industrial engineering changed. Purdue's engineering school was quickly becoming world-renowned, and in that spirit, Purdue became home to formidable pioneers whose attention turned to a formidable field. Among them was a woman whose life and values remain a beacon to the profession, Dr. Lillian Gilbreth. In 1935, at the invitation of President Edward C. Elliott, Lillian Gilbreth joined Purdue's faculty as a professor in management. Lillian came here in the 1930s. If you've ever seen the movie Cheaper by the Dozen, she's getting on the train to come to Purdue at the end of the movie. Uh, and she came at the invitation of Dean Potter, who was a personal friend of hers, and taught human factors, what we call human factors today, at Purdue. A prolific author and researcher, she devoted her energy to motion and time study of complex labor systems, thus bringing human factors to the forefront at Purdue University. After years of nestling its courses in other engineering departments, the School of Industrial Engineering and Management was formed on July 1, 1955. Initially, the school was comprised of two departments, Industrial Management and Transportation, and Industrial Engineering, which was headed by Harold Amrine. Dean George Hawkins placed Professor Hugh Young in charge of the curriculum committee. In 1956, the first baccalaureate program in industrial engineering was instituted. When I came here in 56, I bet you you can't guess what the tuition was. This is a state university in 1956. The tuition was zero for an in-state resident, although there were fees, and the fees were $100 a semester. The graduate program would be formed three years later in 1959. The School of Industrial Engineering and Management was short-lived as the management department broke off to form what would later become Cranert School of Management. Industrial Engineering became its own school in 1961. The change was punctuated by a move from their old facilities in Hevelon Hall to the old Civil Engineering Building in 1964. The newly remodeled facility was renamed Grissom Hall in honor of Purdue graduate Virgil Grissom, the Mercury astronaut who died tragically in an accidental fire during a training mission. That was a big move. That was the first time we were able to bring most of the school together in one place. The building's new libraries and laboratories would serve the school well. In 1963, Moshe Barash joined the faculty and established Purdue's early international prestige in manufacturing with work in computer-aided process planning. With the policy of teaching students to stay ahead of the curve, the School of Industrial Engineering was well on its way to becoming one of the most preeminent programs in the world. In 1969, Ferdinand Leimkuller became the department head. He sought to attract the world's finest researchers in an unprecedented burst of creativity within the school. In 1970, Alan Pritzker led Purdue into the golden age of simulation when he developed simulation languages that were implemented in a family of simulation software. Alan Pritzker had a, had a tremendous effect on, on the growth of simulation at Purdue from the mere fact that not only for what he did, but the people that came here because he was here. And over here there's a row of books, I don't know, 15, 20 books that he wrote. Uh, he's why I came to Purdue uh, and for 15 years, Purdue Industrial Engineering was kind of the center of the world for Monte Carlo uh, simulation of complicated systems. Wilbur Meyer, who became department head in 1974, worked closely with Dean John Hancock for the creation of the Computer Integrated Design, Manufacturing, and Automation Center, better known as SIDMAC, an interdisciplinary effort that capitalized on Barash's efforts in computer manufacturing. SIDMAC was uh... It certainly was, I think, as I say, in my time at Purdue, in those 50 years, I think, our greatest contribution. As director, James Solberg carried the program into its golden age. The National Science Foundation selected IE for one of six engineering research centers, giving Purdue $17.5 million over five years for research in intelligent manufacturing systems, and ultimately, $80 million over the program's lifetime. 
Even President Ronald Reagan visited Purdue for the ERC's dedication. To the best of my knowledge, it's the only time a U.S. Uh, president has actually come to Purdue to dedicate a, a given laboratory. And National Science Foundation has set up many laboratories, but usually the President of the United States doesn't come for the dedication. As the 1980s came to a close, Purdue IE reinforced its fantastic reputation as the school opened up many new areas of research, specifically the looming healthcare crisis. Alan Pritzker gave significant contributions to United Network in organ sharing. Dale Compton spearheaded the institution of the Regenstruf Center in the new Discovery Park, and Nagabusana Prabhu is advancing breast cancer research. As life and technology change rapidly, Purdue IE continues to carry the discipline into new areas, always remaining ahead of the curve. All the while, the program has continued to grow. Between 1977 and 1981, enrollment set new records and numbers increased largely due to women entering the program. Today, women comprise 30% of the program, nearly twice the percentage of the engineering average. By 1986, the steady rise in enrollment made Purdue's IE program the second largest in the country. There's always been the expectation that Purdue should always be considered among the best IE programs in the country. Beginning in 1990, the program ranked number two in the nation and has remained at the top. IE is further distinguished by the profound accomplishments of outstanding alumni, many of whom have found homes at the top of Fortune 500 companies like Whirlpool, IBM, Eli Lilly, United Airlines, and UPS. I think the strength of our program is that we produce graduates who are a lot like stem cells. They are equipped with the skills and the ability to program themselves to suit the environment and excel in it. In its history, through periods of changing industry, the school has provided the leadership by anticipating the future needs of the industry and shaping the discipline. As new challenges emerge, the industry of the past gives way to the industry of the future, catalyzed by the revolutions in nanotechnology, biotechnology, and information technology. One thing is clear, history is about to repeat itself. The school is again poised to lead the way and shape the discipline. The best is yet to come.